All right, let's turn to the Old Testament book of Amos, chapter 8. Amos, chapter 8. <clears throat> Amos, chapter 8. And also, by the way, I forgot to mention this, that my wife, she had some cancer on her nose. And uh, she had to go to the dermatologist a couple different times. And uh, they had did some, they took it off and everything, and everything's fine. And uh, we thank God the last time she went, they said they got it all and everything's great and wonderful. So we thank the Lord for that. Amen. I know several of you folks know all about that cancer thing. And, and, uh, but we thank God that God still hears and answers prayer. Amen. Amos 8, Amos chapter 8, verse 1, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, a basket of, number, uh, a basket of summer fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, the end is come Upon my people of Israel, I will not again pass by them anymore. Well, that's a terrible thing, God not passing by you anymore. Well, that's a sermon right there. Verse 3, And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence. Then let's skip down to verse 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for each one here tonight. We pray, God, that you'll save that lost soul that might be in the building. I pray that you would strengthen and encourage your people, Lord. Help us, God, to live for you in these last wicked, filthy, ungodly, perverted days that we live in. Lord, we want to thank you for all the good singing we heard tonight. And Lord, we thank you for these little boys, these peewee boys here, Lord. We thank you, God, for them. We pray you'll bless them. And uh, Father, we're just good to see young children and teenagers and young adults and older people and everybody singing for you, God. We got a tremendous blessing again, Father. We thank you for the good music tonight. We pray that you'll have your perfect will in this message. Use me for your honor and for your glory, I pray in Jesus' name, and amen. I realize that this here in Amos chapter 8 has a lot of prophetic events in it. I'm not going to get into all the prophecy things here and, and, uh, and so forth. A lot of this is uh, God, and in, in also in the next chapter, chapter 9, the last chapter of Amos, uh, God talks about the final prophecy of dispersion there, and He talks about the future kingdom blessing, the Lord's return, and the reestablishment of the Davidic monarchy, the thousand-year reign, uh, talks about the restoration of Israel, uh, 9, 13 to 15 there, the full kingdom blessing of restored Israel. A lot of this here in Amos has got, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of prophetic things in it. But I want to bring uh, application down to where we live today. I told the church that I pastor, I said, uh, this is 2020 coming up here. And I, I think we ought to have a 2020 vision. Amen. Have 2020 vision this year and just go after souls more than we ever have before. Amen. You say, what's 2020? It's in Acts 2020, uh, where Paul said he went uh, from house to house and all that. Amen. And uh, we need to have a 2020 vision, Acts 2020, and how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but I've showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. We need to have a 2020 vision in this year, 2020. Amen. Now I realize, uh, now here, and this is a lot of prophetic events here, 
and so forth. But I want to bring it down to where you and I live today in this day and time. In Amos 8, 11, it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I'll send a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. I want to bring a message. There's a famine in the land. There's a famine in the land. And I want to say several things uh, by way of introduction. First of all, I want to say that I, I thank God that President Trump got elected in 2016. And I hope and pray that he gets re-elected uh, next year. Or this year. This year. Uh, in November of this year. But I want to tell you something, folks. This country still is wicked. I mean, spiritually and morally, this country is still wicked. And uh, we still need revival in this nation. I thank God that he got elected. I praise God for that. But I want to tell you what, we're still in a mess spiritually and morally. I want to give you several things about this message. There's a famine in the land. First of all, I want to say there's a famine in the land when it comes to preaching. Preaching. I don't know whether you know it or not, but a lot of churches, they don't preach anymore. They don't preach anymore. You say, what are you talking about? They don't preach anymore. I don't know how it is out here in Los Angeles, but I'm sure it's, it's the same way. Amen. But a lot of churches, they show, they have skits, they have plays and dramas. They have, uh, you know, they have uh, amusement parks, you know, and they got all kinds of fun things. And I'm not saying it's wrong to have some fun things for the kids and all that, but I'm just saying that they try to build a church on a bunch of junk. I'm going to tell you what builds churches is preaching and teaching of the Word of God. And if people don't like it, they can lump it. Amen? I'll tell you, that's, what, that's what's going to get the job done. We need good preaching. Amen? Preaching. The Bible says preach the Word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. In 2 Timothy 4 verses 2 to 4. And Isaiah 58 verse 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. In Jeremiah 48, verse 10, it says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully, and cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. Every once in a while, that sword of the Word of God, the Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews 4, 12 says. Every once in a while, that sword ought to cut you. If you and I aren't right with God, it will cut us if it's preached. But the Word of God also will not cut you, uh, not only cut you, but it'll heal you. It's the balm of Gilead. Preaching. There's a fan in the land. You'd be surprised that as I travel around the country, preach here and there and everywhere and so forth, and I've uh, been in the ministry next month, will be 42 years, and uh, uh, started preaching in February of 78. Eight months after I got saved. And you'd be surprised that through the years how many times I've heard uh, people say that, you know, this church or that church or whatever church it is around the country I'm talking about. They say, Brother Kogel, they don't preach in there. The pastor don't preach. He gets up and tells a couple jokes and, uh, and reads something out of the newspaper and makes a few comments on it and, and everything. But they don't really preach. The Bible says... For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe in 1 Corinthians 121. Now, not foolish preaching. It's the foolishness of preaching. You say, what's that mean? That means here you folks are on a Friday night in Los Angeles, California. You know what a lot of people are doing on Friday night? Not only in Los Angeles, but all around the country. They're smoking pot, doing drugs, and getting high. <coughs> and fornicating. Alright, and other things. I'm going to tell you what, you're here in a Bible-believing church. You know what that is? And listen to some guy scream and holler up here, and foam at the mouth, and get red in the face, and everything. This is foolishness to the world. If you'd have told me that I was going to 
listen to it, that I was going to preach, let alone preach, but if you, and I was going to sit and listen to a preacher preach, uh, before I got saved, I'd said, you're crazy. The foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians one twenty one. But the preaching will get the job done. A lot of preachers, they want to share, and they want to cope, and they want to give a little rap session, and they want to have a little seminar, and they want to have a little discussion. We're going to have a little discussion around the table here. And everybody's going to give, everybody's going to give their own interpretation of this verse. What do you think that verse means? Who cares? Amen. Let a preacher get up and preach the Word of God. Amen. I don't care if he screams and hollers, if he just talks. He stands behind the pulpit like this. If he walks around or whatever. I mean, each preacher has different delivery because they have a different personality. Different, God uses different personalities and temperaments. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were all four different men. Peter and Paul were different. Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, all the prophets, apostles, preachers in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. They were all different men that God used. And they all had different personalities. And God uses different men. And He'll mold us, He'll refine us, but He'll use us. And so what, what did God tell Jonah? In Jonah 3, verse 1 and 2. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and hold a seminar. Is that what He said? Go in there and share with them. Have a, have a coping session, a rap session. Jonah, go into Nineveh and discuss with them how they can be successful and prosperous and feel good about themselves and have better self-esteem of themselves. That's the junk you got going on in America today on a lot of these Christian radio stations. I heard one the other day, so help me, I about threw up. And so it is so fine. It is so wonderful to have each and every one of you today listening to our broadcast today. And the good Lord loves each and every one of you. <laughs> Who in the world acts like that? Come on. That's the kind of junk that people's ears are getting used to in America. He said, Jonah, arise, go into Nineveh, that great city. And preach. God said this. Preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. That's what God said. Preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. God said preach to him. That word preach. A lot of churches don't even use that word anymore. Because that offends people. We don't use that word preach. because, Like you preach at them. That might hurt their feelings or offend them. We don't preach at people. That's the problem in America. Jonah 3 verse 4, he cried and said, here's what Jonah preached. It is so wonderful to see all of you wonderful, beautiful people on such a wonderful, beautiful, gorgeous day. God has a miracle for you. Just think positive thoughts and something good is going to happen to you. You think that's what Jonah said? No, that's not what... Jonah had an eight-word sermon. I don't think I've ever preached an eight-word sermon. But Jonah did. And it shows you that that's what God told him to preach. Yet, 40 days and Nineveh shall be... Oh, come on, Jonah. Don't be so negative. Shall be blessed. Shall be overthrown. He said, the judgment of God's going to come down on you. What a negative, condemning message. And God told him to preach that. Matthew 3, 1, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Matthew 4, 17, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent! You know, repentance didn't preach that much anymore today. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There's a fan in the land when it comes to preaching. Number two, 
There's a famine in the land when it comes to the power of God. 2 Timothy 1.7 For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's given us a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. Psalm 62.11 Power belongeth unto God. You know the last thing Jesus said in Acts 1.8 before He left this earth? But ye shall receive power. That's what we need today. I'm not talking about speaking in tongues. I'm not talking about rolling around the floor. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the power of God on your life. A lot of people are saved. They're born again. They got saved. They repented. They received Christ. But they don't have the power of God on them. You can't lose the Holy Spirit as far as salvation is concerned. But you can lose that filling of the Holy Spirit. That touch of God on your life. They were filled more than once in the book of Acts. You know why? We leak. I don't mean leak in the sense of losing your salvation, losing the Spirit as far as uh, salvation is concerned. I'm talking about the power of God on your life. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. A, a Spirit-filled Christian is a Christian that walks with God on a daily basis. Just walks with God. There's a famine in the land when it comes to the power of God and the presence of God. But you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Acts 1.8, Jesus said. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me. You know what that power of God upon you is for? It's for witnessing. See, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons and all the false cults and false religions, they all have a message. And they get out there and give it too. Knock on doors and go out. I mean, they, they all hit the streets out there. But they, the Holy Spirit doesn't bear witness with their message. Because Paul said that they have another Jesus, another gospel, and another spirit. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4. I think I'm going too fast. They're smiling back here in the window. I get going. I can't, I can't slow down. But anyways, I try to slow down. My wife said, Steve, you talk too fast sometimes when you're up there preaching. I said, I know it. She said, you make a good auctioneer. <laughs> you ever heard of auctioneers? <laughs> Ephesians 6.10 Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. You'd be surprised what you can do with the power of God. I'm not going to turn there for the sake of time. But in Mark chapter 6, Jesus sent His apostles out and gave them power over unclean spirits. Three chapters later in Mark 9, Mark 9, 17 to 28, the disciples come to Him and they, they try to cast out the demons and evil spirits out of this individual and they couldn't do it. They lost the power from Mark 6 to Mark 9. Three chapters. He gave them the power in Mark 6, verse 7 and verse 13. And in three chapters later, in Mark 9, 17 to 28, the, the disciples come to Jesus and say, we can't cast out these demons, these evil spirits out of this individual. They lost the power in three chapters. I don't know how much time elapsed from Mark 6 to Mark 9. I get maybe Howley's or somebody's chronological... Think of the Gospels or something, but I don't know how, how much time, but it probably wasn't more than a few days or a few weeks, I wouldn't think. We can't lose the power of God. We can't lose the power of God. There was a man in the Bible named Samson. And I'm not going to go through everything that he did, but I do. I would like for you to keep your finger in Amos 8 and look at Judges chapter 16. I've got to show you this. I could tell you, but I, I, want you to show, I want you to see this, folks. In Judges... Judges chapter number 16. This man did wonderful things when he had the power of God on his life. But young people, you know how he lost the power of God? Through sin. You know what will zap the power of God right out of you in a split second? Is diddle daddling around with Delilah. Sin. 
you'll lose the touch of God and the power of God. The Bible call, talks about anointing in 1 John 2. Uh, people call it the anointing, the filling of the Spirit, the power of God, whatever you, whatever you want to call it there. A biblical thing. I'm not talking about the charismatics. I'm talking about biblical words. But whatever it is, we need to have that in our lives. You need to have the touch of God. They say, I've heard preachers, older preachers say, that when Dr. Bob Jones Sr. walked into a room, they said you could feel God. I'm talking about Dr. Bob Jones Sr. They say, I'm not saying he's God. I'm saying he had God just all over him, dripping all over him. I went down to a camp meeting back in 82, 82 or 83, down south, Myrtle, Mississippi, Dr. Percy Ray. And me and a couple of preachers went down there, and I never met him before in my life, but he, he, had a, he wore a hat, cowboy hat, and he had cowboy boots on. And Myrtle, Mississippi, and I went down there, it's a Southern Baptist camp meeting, I'm telling you what, some those Southern Baptist boys got up and preached the bark off the tree, man. This is in the early 80s. Laverne Butler out of Louisville, Kentucky, got up and preached on Moses, a man under pressure. Uh, I'm telling you what, Ronnie Simpson, those guys, they got up and flat preached. But I was, I was registering, me and a couple preachers were registering there for the camp meeting. And make a long story short, uh, Dr. Percy Ray walked right by me, right behind me, I, I, look, I glance like this and see him. I, I, you could say I'm crazy. You could say, Kogel, you're a charismatic. You're going crazy, Kogel. Come on now. But when he walked by, it was like, whew, you could feel God. You say, well, how's it come? He walked with God. He's filled with the power of God in his life. Prayed three or four hours a day. A day. I heard Dr. Don Green, who himself is was quite a preacher, who if he lives to be in, to, in June, he'll be 92, Dr. Green. He pastored in uh, Lansing, Michigan for 60 years. He pastored that church. I preached for him up there. And Dr. Green, he's in a wheelchair now. He, he can't preach. His son, one of his sons, his youngest son, I think Jimmy took the church over four or five years ago. But Dr. Green... I've heard him tell, he told me this personally. He said this in messages through the years. He said this back in 83 or 84 on a message I got of his. He said, he said I believe that Dr. Percy Ray is the most spiritual man in America. Dr. Green said this. He's pretty spiritual himself. He said, if that man ain't gonna pray, isn't going to pray for me, I don't want him to pray against me. He said, that man has power with God. He said, when that man prays, God listens. You say, that's just a preacher. He's a preacher, though. I'm not a preacher, uh, Brother Kogel. Every Christian can have the power of God in their life. <clears throat> Male, female, <clears throat> it don't matter whether you're a preacher or not. Every Christian. Be not drunk with wine or to success, but be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18. The charismatics have scared us Bible-believing Baptists away from that thing in the past 50 years. We're not talking about rolling around on the floor and all that. We're talking about a daily walk with God. There's a famine in the land when it comes to the power of God. By the way, I think I might have said this through the years. I can't remember what I say where, but there was a there's that camp meeting at Myrtle, Mississippi. Some, one of the men, they got men dorms and women dorms. And one of the men was in the shower and he put, put his clothes there off to the side there with his billfold and his pants. And somebody stole his billfold. They're on the campgrounds. Dr. Ray got up, over a thousand people in that tabernacle, 12, 1400 probably. And uh, he got up and he said, he had a real rough, gravelly voice. He got up and you could hear a pin drop. I got something I want to say. Seems that there's a man, a brother was taking a shower and somebody stole his billfold. He said, I want to tell you what I'm going to do. He looked out the congregation. You could hear a pin drop. He said, I'm going to pray. If that billfold's not returned by this time tomorrow night, 
He said, I'm going to pray that God withers your hand. When he said, wither, withers your hand, it was like, you could feel the power of God come in that place. I'm serious. I know you think I'm crazy. I'm telling you what, you can just feel God. I'm going to pray God withers your hand. And there's a couple preachers that live down there in that Myrtle, Mississippi area. A couple area pastors that were there at that meeting. And they looked over at me and a couple other preachers that I was there with. And they said, that billfold will be returned tomorrow night, by tomorrow night. He said, that man there, he said, that, he said, I'm telling you what, he said, that isn't returned. He said, whoever stole that, their hand will be withered. Wow. Next night, Percy Ray got up. He said, I want to thank God that billfold was returned with all the money in it. You say, that was years ago, Brother Kogel. God doesn't do these things today. That's what the devil's telling you. That's what the devil's convinced some of you probably. Stinking, rotten, lying devil. Jesus said he's a liar and the father of it. You know where he works on you at, Christian? Right there. There's the warfare right there in the brain. You got to say, get out of here, devil. There's a famine in the land when it comes to the power of God. Judges 16. Samson, I don't need to go through the whole story here. You know he had the power of God and he lost it. But look at Judges 16, verse 18. Judges 16, verse 18. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart. you got to be careful who you tell all your heart to. You better be careful. She sent and called for the lords of the Philistines saying... Come up this once, for he has showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand. Boy, the, there's always a dollar bill behind it, isn't there? Corruption. Verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees, and she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head, and she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. Let me tell you something. When you sin against God, he's messing with Delilah, and you sin against God, you not only use spiritual, lose spiritual strength, it, can, it affects you physically. When you're not right with God, it affects you definitely spiritually, but it affects you physically. It drieth the bones. A merry, the merry heart doeth good like a medicine. But other, these other things, they dry the bones, that proverb says. All right, verse 20, and she said, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep, <clears throat> and watch this, and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. He don't even know, he doesn't even realize that the power of God is gone from him. That's what's sad. You know, there's churches. They go on month after month and pay the bills because they have a few people in there. It's got a few bucks, you know. They can, they can keep the lights on and, you know, pay the bills every month. But they haven't seen the power of God in 50 years. They're, they don't even know the Lord's departed from them. Verse 21. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes. Look at that. Put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he did grind in the prison house. Howbeit the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaven. I got a little outline here. Sin blinds you, they put his eyes out. You lose your vision. Where, no vision, where there's no vision, the people perish. Got to have a vision. Jack Wood used to say, God's got a world vision. For God so loved the world. Vision. Sin blinds, it binds, binds you. Binds you up, man. You know, there's people all over L.A., they're just bound up in sin. Look at their faces. They haven't smiled in 10 years, probably, some of them. I'm, talking about, I'm not just talking about this area, I'm talking about the whole country. I sit in airports all over the place all the time, layover, going from one place to another through the years. I've never seen so many miserable looking people in all my life. I'm not saying you got to laugh and giggle 24 hours a day. That's fake. 
That's not real life. But you could still have the joy in your heart. It blinds, it binds, it finds. Be sure your sin will find you out. It grinds. It says at the end of verse 21, he did grind in the prison house. And then fifthly, it winds you up dead, which he will be dead by the end of the chapter. Samson. And if it doesn't wind you up as a Christian dead, it winds you up in a mess. And an unsaved person, sin winds them up in a hell, lake of fire. Sin blinds, binds, finds, grinds, and winds you up. He lost his power, his vision, his influence. He, uh, we're going to see here in a minute, he was a joke to the people. He was a, had lost his life, lost his discernment, his physical and spiritual strength. He lost his separation. Well, you could preach hours on that one. Now, he lost the, the power of God. You say, what do you mean he lost the power of God? Now, look here, folks, at Judges 16, 23. Then the lords of the Philistines gathered them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon, their God. Everybody's got a God. And to rejoice. For they said, our God hath delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. <clears throat> 24. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy. And the destroyer of our country. Destroyer? You know, people get a... They get a warped idea about Bible-believing Christians. They think that you're the problem. You know who these left-wing, God-hating, reprobate politicians thinks the problem is? You and I. Listen to them. Which slew many of us. 25, and it came to pass when their hearts were merry, that they said, call for Samson, now watch this, that he may make us sport. Sport, what's that word mean? I'll tell you in a minute. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport. There it is again. And they set him between the pillars. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, Suffer me that I may feel the pillars whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women. Think about this. That beheld while Samson made sport. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee. So from the soul, and he asked for his strength again in 28, 29. Look at 29. And Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood. Look at this. This guy's carrying the whole house. And on which it was borne up of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Jack Wood preached a message years ago. And he said, I don't want to die with the Philistines. Samson did. I'm talking about this guy was a powerhouse for God. You read Judges 13 to 16. Those four chapters sometime. He bowed to himself with all his might, and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. What a sad ending. Now what does sport mean? This means they put him through all kinds of humiliating things for their amusement. See, when you lose your testimony, you're a joke to the world. Samson has been reduced from a powerhouse for God to entertaining the world. This is what has happened in the churches in America today, a lot of them. To compete with Hollywood and New York and Los Angeles and Chicago and television and Hollywood and all these things. The churches in the past 50 years have brought in the worldly music. The light shows. A lot of churches have big light shows. You say, what? Yeah. They're competing with Hollywood. Uh, costumes, makeup, Bozo the Clown. The Karate Kid. hi -ya! hi -ya! We're going to have the Karate Kid. So they can have a big crowd. They have to resort to worldly methods and gadgets.
to get the world to come in. But then you don't really have a flock. You got a zoo. Come and look at all the different animals. Amen. That's what you, I mean, that's what you have. And so you got all this stuff, amusement stuff. Why? To draw a crowd. A lot of churches in America in the last 50 years have gotten rid of Bible preaching and teaching and they put on some Hollywood production and spectacular extravaganza to get the people to come to church. Because that tantalizes the flesh. Preaching is... A, That's the church reduced from Holy Ghost power to Hollywood entertainment in the past 40, 50 years. And to compete with the world. We're not competing with the world. You can't compete with Hollywood. You're not supposed to compete with Hollywood. And Disneyland out here in Orlando, Florida, it's Disney World. You can't compete with all that. We're not supposed to. There's a part of a human being that there's a spiritual part of you. And that spirit, that's why people get involved in all kinds of false religions and transcendental meditation, all this stuff. Because there's a part of you that reaches out for God. But the thing of it is the devil warps people and gets them in false religions and all this other junk. Our job is to get them on the right track and get them to Jesus. In the churches in America, it's become a contest and competition in the past 40 or 50 years of which church has the most carnal, worldly, fleshy activities and frills and thrills and entertainment to satisfy the carnal, worldly, fleshy appetites of the average born-again Christian. And I'm not trying to be mean, but I'm going to tell you something. That's why, and I'm not picking on Joel Osteen, because there's a lot of preachers like him around on TV and around the country. In the world. But that's why my mother, who's unsaved, and I love my mother, and I'm praying for her salvation. But she told me a few years ago, she said, Steve, I really like to listen to Joel Osteen. I said, Mom, he's not a preacher. He don't preach. Oh, Stevie, now. I said, Mom, he's not a preacher. He's a cheerleader. God wants to bless you. I am what the Bible says I am. I can do what the Bible says I can do. <laughs> All that junk. His wife's a better preacher than he is. Victoria? She says more than he does. You said you listen to him? I, about three minutes, and that's all I can handle. Amen. You sound like you ought to say that. I more preachers ought to say it. Because what happens is Americans are sitting in their living room watching him and all that positive junk, and they come into a Bible believing church and hear your pastor or one of these other preachers preach. And they walk in, they go, Ugh. Oh, he's a negative hate monger. He doesn't bring positive things out and tell us how much God loves us and going to bless us all the time. I preach about love. Love not the world, either the things that are in the world. Luke 9, 43, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. We've substituted a lot of worldly, carnal, fleshy things for the power and the presence of God, folks. There's a famine in the land when it comes to the power of God. Moving. I'll tell you this, and I'll go on here. I know it's getting... But <clears throat> I've been in a lot of church services where you feel the presence of God. I'm, I'm not denying that. But there's only been about four or five times in the last 42 and a half years since I've been saved that I've really felt I mean, Brother Estep always said that the Holy Spirit comes in waves. And I remember one of his, uh, really two of his camp meetings. I was down in Mount Airy, North Carolina a couple times. I've, I've seen the power of God down there. The uh, John and Mary Anderson just got done singing, I'll meet you by the river. I'm telling you what, they were shouting that place down. And uh, they met, in a, they had a jubilee, a King James jubilee, and a brother Lackey did. Uh, I preached at it many times in the 80s and 90s there. And uh, he'd have uh, uh, the King James jubilee. 
John and Mary uh, were singing down there. And that place come unglued. I mean, people shouting and praising God, getting things right with each other. And the Spirit of God come in there. Nobody, you can't pump it up. You can't prime it up. You can't personality it up. You can't program it up. It's just God. And God come in there for about 40, 45 minutes. Nobody talked in tongues. Nobody rolled around on the floor. I was at Brother E. Steps camp meeting one year in Dayton, Ohio. A couple times this happened back in the 80s. And uh, they were going to their new building. And uh, people were mad at each other and mad at Brother E. Step. And I don't know, there's the stuff going on in the church and everything. And uh, <clears throat> Brother Rex Harrison, some of you know Rex Harrison, he just got up and sang. I mean, he went from one song to the other on the piano. You know, the way he sang and everything. He was, he was crippled, wasn't he, Brother Shreff? And uh, yeah, he, he, he sat there at the piano and went from one song to the other. And somebody had just got done preaching. I, I forget who it was. They preached against everything that moved. I'm serious. They pre I forget who it was. No, they preached against this back in the 80s. They preached against everything that moved. And if it didn't move, they kicked it so it moved. And then they preached against it. Amen. I mean, they preached against everything. And, uh, and then Rex Harrison got up and sang one song to another and went there. And the power and Holy Spirit of God come in that place. <sighs> I sat there, I sat there, I got contact lenses in, I'm going, my contact lens is fogged up, I'm serious, I'm, I'm, you say, you're crazy, no, I'm not, and I looked over at the other preachers, I said, man, the power of God's in this place, they said, it sure is, brother Estep, didn't pump it up, prime it up, and try to get it all stirred up himself, you know, in the flesh, no, it was God, people come down, we're apologizing to brother Estep about some things, Ill feelings they had towards him. The people mad at each other, fussing with each other and everything. This couple don't like that couple, and this guy don't like that guy. This woman's had ill feelings towards this woman. I mean, all kinds of stuff going on. They was all hugging each other, snotting and crying at the altar. Power of God come in that place, man. You say, I thought that was just in the book of Acts. Oh, no. Nope. Seen that two different times there at his camp meetings in the 80s. Just twice. You say twice? That's twice. Now, they've had a lot of good services and everything. You can feel the Spirit of God and stuff. But man, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about God coming in like a mighty rushing wind. Whew. Lasted about 40, 45 minutes. And then it subsided. You can't, you can't stop it. You can't say, stop. Holy Ghost, stop. Because you and I don't control it. It just subsides. I was sitting there. About, it about wore me out. You said, what'd you do? What was you doing? Nothing sitting there. No wonder we got to get a new body. Your fleshy, earthly, tabernacle body couldn't stand it two seconds in heaven. You'd melt. That's why God's got to give you oh, a new glorified body. Amen. Couldn't handle it. Famine in the land it comes to the preaching, preaching and power of God. Thirdly, there's a famine in the land when it comes to prayer. We talk about prayer. We sing about prayer. We teach and preach about prayer. You know, one time the disciples come to Jesus in Luke 11, 1. You know what they said to him? They said, Lord, teach us how to build the biggest church in Los Angeles. You think I asked that? that? You think they said... Lord, teach us how to preach. Lord, teach us how to sing. Nope. Lord, teach us how to be a teacher of the Word of God. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. They could have asked for a lot of things. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. In 2020, we're only three days into the new year. This is January 3rd. Three days. Let's pray more this year like we never have before and really actually believe that God is still alive and He's still on the throne 
And He still hears and answers prayer and wants to answer your prayer. You say, well, I've been preaching, uh, praying for a long time about a particular thing and He still hadn't answered it. Keep on praying. Colossians 4, 2, continue in prayer. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. You know, he said in Luke 18, 1, that men ought to always to pray and not to faint. You know, in Acts chapter 9, I'm not going to turn there, but I'll just tell you what it says. You can look it up some other time. But in Acts 9, when God tells Ananias that it's all right now, you don't have to worry about wicked Saul, who became Paul, his name is Paul, but he's called Saul then. He said, God, God doesn't say to Ananias, he doesn't say that Saul has believed. He doesn't say that God, uh, Paul, Saul got saved or got born again. You know what he says in Acts 9, 11? God says in verse 11 to Ananias about Saul, he says, For behold, he prayeth. You see the emphasis that God placed on prayer there? He could have said, Ananias, you don't have to worry about it. I know you heard about Paul uh, killing Christians and all that kind of thing. But I want to tell you something. He got saved. God don't say that to Ananias. He don't say, he got born again. You don't have to worry about it. He's received Christ as his Savior. He don't say none of that. He says in Acts 9, verse 11, For behold, he prayeth. And he was talking about his conversion account. For behold, he prayeth. How about that? That's something. You know, in uh, Matthew 21, verse 12 to 15, we're not going to turn to these verses for the sake of time. But in Matthew 21, verse 12 to 15, you know what God calls his house? He says, you've made my house. He says, uh, uh, den of thieves and all that. But you know what God calls his house in Matthew 21, 12 to 15? God, God calls his house the temple. He doesn't call it the house of preaching. He don't call it the house of teaching or the house of worship or the house of praising or the house of fellowshipping or the house of tithing. Although all those things are in the house of God. But he calls it the house of prayer. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 21, verse 12 to 15. He calls it a house of prayer. It's also in Mark eleven seventeen and Luke 19, 46. You know, Isaiah 59, 16 says, And he, God saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. God wondered that there was no intercessor for Israel. I wonder if he wonders why there's not more intercessors for America. And for a lost and dying world. You know, China has approximately 1.4 billion people. India has a little less, 1.3 1, 1, or something, 1.3. Both those countries right there have almost 3 billion billion people of the world's 7 billion population. Think how many of them are lost. Think of them. For God so loved the world. He wondered there's no, no man. He wondered there's no intercessor. Isaiah 64, 7. And there was none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. We need to stir ourselves up to take hold of the horns of the altar and get a hold of God and say, God, I'm not going to let go. As, as uh, uh, In Genesis 32 there, an example of this is Jacob wrestling with the angel of the Lord until the breaking of day. And he said to that angel, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. As carnal as Jacob was. Jacob is a picture of a Christian that does everything in the flesh. I don't have time to preach about Jacob. But Jacob's like a lot of Christians. They don't really pray to God about anything. They just do what they want to do, when they want to do it, the way they want to do it. They just work in the flesh constantly throughout their whole 50 years of their Christian life. But I'll tell you what, he got that one right. He said, I'll not let thee go except thou bless me. Let's grab a hold of God in 2020. You've been praying for us. Maybe the loved one to get saved. I pour down, I pray that God pours down Holy Ghost conviction upon them. My loved ones, it's not saved. You say, well, that's not, that's not a nice thing to do. It's better than them dying and going to hell. 
Number four, quickly, I'll just mention this real quick. There's a famine in the land when it comes to purity. Holiness and godliness. Purity. 1 Timothy 5.22, keep thyself pure. Pure. Sin is rampant in America. Adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism, transgender, <clears throat> drunkenness, drinking alcohol. You know a lot of Christians in churches are drinking alcohol? In Baptist churches even in America. They don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's sin. Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. Proverbs 20, verse 1. Jesus drank new wine, great juice. There's a difference. He didn't drink fermented liquor. Uh, we got drugs everywhere. People shacking up. Covetousness. Pride. Boasters. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. Traitors. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. D jealousy. Envy. Backbiting. Stealing. Thieves. Burglary. Extortion. Embezzlement. Corrupt politicians. Murder. Rape. Inventors of evil things. Covenant breakers. That's just a few. You said you have to name sins? That's the problem in America. Preachers don't do that no more. A lot of them don't. The only way, you're, the only way a person is going to have joy in their life is getting things right with God. And stuff's preached on. Number five. There's a famine in the land when it comes to praise. Psalms 50, 23. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me. A lot of times we praise everybody and everything in the world except God. Psalms 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. You say, well, you, you don't know what I'm going through, preacher. I found out that even when we go through trials and discouraging times, disappointing times, you can still have that joy unspeakable and full of glory down in your soul. Psalms 107.32, praise Him in the assembly. Psalms 119.164, seven times a day do I praise Thee. You know, in Acts 16.22-25, Paul and Silas were beaten with many stripes and thrown into the inner prison. Stocks. Bonds. Paul was in the stocks and bonds. Amen. He got the stocks and bonds. But it wasn't the kind that you and I are talking about. Amen. And it says that at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed. By the way, at midnight, there's a lot of things that happen at midnight in the Bible. That's the whole outline. That's one of them right there. Acts 16, 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. In, in Luke 19, 37 to 40. You know what the Lord said about those stones? He said, if the people hold their peace, he said, the rocks, the stones will cry out and praise him. In Luke 19, 37 to 40. You say, stones, rocks start talking? A donkey talked. How would you like to see a Balaam's donkey talk in Numbers 22? That would have been a sight. Number six, there's a famine in the land when it comes to parenting. Parenting. Psalms 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. <clears throat> Ephesians 6, 4, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. <clears throat> I just want to say this. I'm not trying to make anybody mad, but... <clears throat> Luke 21, 16 says, You shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kinsfolks and friends, and some of you shall they cause be put to death. I looked up that word betray. It means to give over in the sense of delivering a person or thing to be kept by another, to deliver over treacherously by way of betrayal. It says about Judas and Jesus, Matthew 26, 15 and 16, What will you give me and I will deliver him unto you? Judas asked the priest. 
and 16, and from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. There's a lot of parents in the United States and around the world who are betraying their children and delivering them over to the chief priest. The, the enemy, by doing certain things or not doing certain things. Genesis 42, 22 says, do not sin against the child. I just give these real quick. Be enough to kind of get some of you maybe mad and upset a little bit. And I, let me say something. Hey, I got five children. And, you know, they're not Apostle Pauls. Okay? So I'm not trying to act like, you know, all my kids are Apostle Pauls and, you know, are perfect little angels. But I want to say this. My wife and I brought them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And they know what's right. Some of them serve God, some of them halfway serve God, if you know what I mean. When a parent acts different at home than they do at church or out in public, you're betraying that child. When you constantly buttonhole a child about every little thing, I believe a child ought to behave in church, and you know, wherever. But I mean, some parents expect the child to be a robot. He blinked his eye. Did you blink your eyeball? I mean, back off a little bit. You got to give them a little bit of room to breathe. Amen. When you let them watch filthy, wicked, perverted, sexual, sensual, worldly, ungodly trash on TV. And I'll probably get some of you mad about this. Don't let your child or teenager especially have a computer in their own bedroom. You have that computer out in the family room where everybody's walking by and can see when people are on it what they're seeing. Do I need to elaborate on that? I wouldn't let I wouldn't let a child, I wouldn't let a teenager have their own computer in their own bedroom. They might like to keep that door shut a lot. And as soon as somebody comes in. You say, are you saying that my child? There's a lot of pressure on young people, especially today. Even older people. Better be careful. I got it. My wife's got a nephew. He's a preacher. To make a long story short, he was looking up some word one time and a bunch of filth come on. And he called his wife in there and said, Paula, come in here. He said, I, and I think they got a filter or something so that some of that junk wouldn't come on, but a bunch of junk. When, a, when parents cut down or criticize the pastor or any preacher in front of their children, or cut down other people in the church in front of their children, you're cutting your own throat. You're cutting your own throat. Because your children will never listen to that pastor. Because you have And I'm not saying anybody in here has done that. I hope you haven't. But there are people in churches around America that do this. They have fried, roasted preacher every Sunday. At the dinner table where the kids can hear all the negative comments. You think that child's going to listen to your pastor? No. He's going to think he's a buffoon. I don't know if there's a word in Korean for buffoon, but I just come up with that word. Amen. <laughs> By not correcting, disciplining, and ch ch uh, chastising that child, according to Proverbs, you're betraying your child. Because I don't believe in spanking. You don't believe the Bible. As a matter of fact, the Bible doesn't even use the word spank ever. You say, what's it use? Beat. <laughs> Proverbs. I bet they change that word in the new versions. Now, we're not talking about child abuse. See, you've got to clarify everything today. We're not talking about child abuse. I think I ought to hang a child abuser up by their toenails. Amen. Cut their head off. But <clears throat> I'm not talking about child abuse. Talk about biblical discipline. 
that child has to be taught that there are boundaries. There, see, this right here teaches me, this is all the farther I can go right here. This is a boundary, walls. A child has to have walls. You know why? Because if he thumbs his nose up at parents, he'll thumb his nose up at the principal at school and the teachers and the policemen. Any authority in his life, he will just thumb his nose up because mommy and daddy thought it was cute. And they all laughed. <laughs> Isn't he cute? He's rebelling. She's rebelling. Aren't they cute? It might be cute when they're two or three, but it won't be cute when they're 16. Or 18 or 20 or 25. They have to be taught that there's boundaries. The Bible literally talks about beating them. You deliver their soul from hell. Because then if they're taught authority, when the Holy Ghost starts dealing with their heart, and they get to the age of accountability or whatever age, the God starts dealing with their heart, they're more apt to submit and get saved. Otherwise, if they're just rebellious, they'll just thumb their nose up at God and say, you don't tell me what to do. One of my boys told me the other day, he's got four kids now. He said, Dad, he said, the oldest girl there, Madison, she, he said, I don't really remember her, her doing this. But he said, Mackenzie, he said, Dad, he said, me and Jess will tell her, Mackenzie, don't touch that, and she'll go. <laughs> he said, Dad, he goes, I said, Seth, that's that old Adamic nature. The old Adamic nature that we're all born with. When I travel down the road and the sign says 60 miles an hour, there's something immediately within me that says, I'll go 70 if I want to. That's that law, that law of, the, of the sin and, and all that in Romans 7 that Paul talked about. It's in, a, it's in all of us. You're born with it. You go by this right here, the piano, and it says, do not touch wet paint. Now, if there's no sign on it, I just walk by. I don't even think nothing of it. I don't even care about touching it. But when I go by it, do not touch wet paint. You say, what is that? That's in you and I. That's what Paul talked about in Romans 6, 7, and 8. Especially 7. But what I would do, I do, I not. But what I would, that do I. But what I would, that do I. But what I do not. The, all that in Romans 7. That's that right there. It's in everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to preach this long. Let me, let me wrap this up. Uh, uh, I'm talking about betraying that child. Uh, by not having prayer and family devotions and Bible reading in the home. And let me say this about the family. I, I, I'm not trying, you can do whatever you want. You know, it's between you and God. I'm not trying to tell you how to, get, to run your home. But a lot of Bible believers, they think, you know, they got to get their wife and kids. And they got to have an hour and a half, you know, church service every night. You don't have to do that. Just sing a couple songs. The, the husband, the father, read a verse. Explain it for a couple minutes. And then say, Kids, anything you've got to say? Yeah, I would like to thank God for this and that. Testimony or two. Then have prayer and dismiss. If you're going to do it several times a week especially, you don't have to have an hour and a half message and sermon and church service every night. Amen? Five or ten minutes would be, you know. By not attending Sunday school and church faithfully, and the church services, when you're able, you're betraying your child. Now, you might get by with it when they're two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight years old. They start getting up 9, 10, 11, or whatever, 12. They're going to see what mommy and daddy does. How's come we don't go to church on Wednesday night, mommy? How's come we don't go to church back on Sunday night? How's come we just go... Sunday morning to the church service and not Sunday school. You say, I don't think that's really that important, Sunday school. The teacher studied all week. And basically you're saying, 
you don't have to study. I'm not going to show up. <clears throat> we don't care about your Sunday school lesson. When I got saved, I wanted to be in church. I've been this way since I got saved. I want to be in church every time the doors open, if I'm able. Now, if you're sick or something come up or something, that's, you know, I'm not talking about that. God knows. I'm saying if you're able, if you're able. Man, I, I love being in church. Dr. Green there, as I mentioned earlier, in Lansing, Michigan, he said, my dad was a Baptist preacher. My grandpa was a Baptist preacher. He said, this is all I've ever known. He's talking about people that don't go back to church on Sunday night. And he goes, and he wasn't being a smart like He goes, he got a real, his face was real quizzical. He said, what do you do on Sunday nights if you don't go back to church? Like, what in the world could be more important than church? But a lot of Christians think there's a lot of things more important. You say, I like to watch TV on Sunday. There ain't nothing good on TV on Sunday night. Uh, by letting that teenager choose what church they want to go to or what church the whole family is going to go to. You know, there's people in this country that get up on Sunday morning and say, 13-year-old daughter, what church you want to go to, honey? 14, 15, 16-year-old teenage son, what church you want to go to today? What church do you think they're going to pick, the average teenager in America? Take a big, take a guess. You only get one guess. You think the average teenager in America is going to say, I want to go to a rip-snorting, fire-breathing, sin-condemning, God-loving, Bible-believing Baptist church. I want to go where they got the contemporary rock. They got the rock band. I want to go where they got the new versions. And a little little wimpy preacher gets up and don't preach enough Bible to put in the left eye of a blind mosquito. You think I I'm not trying to be a smart aleck. You think I ever let any of my five kids determine what church we're going to? <laughs> Oh, you betray that child. Let that teenager or even, even 18, 25-year-old get in a car alone with a boy or a girl or anywhere alone. Don't let him get alone. You say, are you saying that my son or daughter is a, some pervert or something? All flesh is as grass. I don't trust your flesh. I don't trust my flesh. Make, put you on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Romans 13, 14. Don't provide ways to sin for your flesh. Don't get yourself in predicaments and situations and in a place somewhere where it looks, doesn't look real good. You betray them. You let, when you let that boy or that girl <clears throat> court an unsaved person or even a Christian boy or girl that's not marriage material, whatever, let me tell you something. When they turn 18, there ain't nothing you can do. The day your son or daughter turns 18, there ain't nothing you can do. You say, what do you mean there ain't nothing I can do? They're 18. You can't, they're 18, they can go into service, they can go in the army, they can do whatever. They don't need your permission. They can get married. Marry whoever they want to marry. I'm talking about before they're 18. There have been times that I've tried to discourage a couple of my kids about some different things. Most of the time they listened about a lot of the things, but some things they didn't. Got themselves in a big mess. You say, your kids? Yeah. You say, you must not be a very good parent. You think God was a good parent to Israel? You know what he called them in Isaiah 1, verse 1 and 2? Rebellious children have gone astray. So don't sit there and kick yourself if one of your kids or a couple of your kids have done something, done stupid things or something. 
God's a great parent and his children, Israel, went astray. That's Isaiah 1, verse 1 and 2. By not discouraging that child from becoming transgender. I'm serious. I was in the airport there coming from Columbus to Denver, Denver to L.A. yesterday, and two lesbians were in front of me in Denver. And the one girl, bless her heart, I mean, they look so miserable. And she's trying to look like a guy. She's got her hair like a guy and walks like a guy. And the girl in the relationship, she's a halfway cute girl. I looked at them and I thought, both of them look so miserable. My heart broke. I got mad first. <laughs> and then I thought, you know, the two lesbians are standing right in front of me. And then my heart broke. Because I looked at their faces and I thought, they look so miserable. Now here's you got one that she's a woman, female, and she's trying to act like a guy. If you're not what God made you and you don't get saved and serve God and have the joy of the Lord, you're not a happy human being. You know why all those people look so miserable? Because they're doing the exact opposite of what God made them for. And then I just got this real quick. I'll tell you this and we'll be done. Uh, there's a famine in the land when it comes to politicians that love God. I don't need to preach on that. We'll be here till midnight. Paul was long preaching in Acts 20. He preached till midnight. I don't, plan on, I don't plan on doing that tonight. But politicians that love God, famine in the land. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, there's, Paul talked about the gifts of different gifts, gifts of governments. So some Christians do have a gift of governments. Politics, not very many, but a few of them. The thing is, you've got to be such a lying rascal to get into politics. If you're honest and everything, it's, Hard to get 20 votes. And last of all, there's a famine in the land when it comes to passion for souls. We need a passion for souls, folks. Amen. All right, we're going to have an altar call. The pianist would come ahead and play the piano.